we're talking about life after life. And we use the simplest possible logical argument, just pure logic, to engage us in the discussion. And the, the simplest logic is, as uh, you'll know already if you read my article, uh, my short essay about the whereabouts of heaven, the, the logical argument is if the absolute best visualisation we can have of heaven is as a garden or as a, a place of sweets and treats, then what does heaven look like for a gardener? Because that's a problem. You've got an individual who spent their whole life dedicated to tending gardens in one capacity or another somehow and you're sending them supposedly for eternity to a garden. What are they going to want to do? I, I seriously suggest that they're not going to want to sit back and sun themselves they're going to want to contribute. It's, their, it's what they're good at. It's what they're trained to do. It's what they've enjoyed. The point is, a rest, a holiday is great. A rest is great. But imagine the frustration of wanting to be able to contribute and being prevented from contributing. We need a better conception of life after life than sweets and treats. And I suggest that no better conception is given than the one that I've been using for decades, Tom Cruise. So when I'm going to school and I'm choosing my O-levels and then my A-levels and thinking about future life, what I want for myself. I'm not considering the sort of life that Tom Cruise has had. That is simply not open to me. He doesn't compete with me for my work. I don't compete with him for his work. Being not Tom Cruise, but any actor, any artist of that, of that level is symptomatic of having lived more experience than I had when I started out on my life. It's not a question of one of, of better or worse. It's simply a question of where you are on a path. It's very easy to see that with respect to artists. We've got other situations where we'd like to, where we'd like to be able to apply a logic so that we can sort out our thinking. I mentioned as opposed to work, leisure and spirit and one of the things I've become interested in in recent years is the phenomenon that I see in certain individuals of being self-directed. If one has spent one's, if one has been lured into a trap, whether it be drink, drugs, gambling, if one has fallen into a hole, climbing out of that hole 
is something that one has achieved oneself. One cannot be pulled out of that hole against one's will. If there's one thing you've learned by the time you kick addiction, as I know from simply from the experience of smoking, if there's one thing you know, it's that you've learned to obey. You've learned to be obedient when the time is right to outside guidance. You yourself may, may have fallen short, but with the help of outside guidance, you can exceed your own limits. <clears throat> I don't think I managed to do that when I was stopping smoking. I think I found a trick, a way around it, which was hugely beneficial to me and hopefully to other people, which was learning to eat for taste instead of, instead of the alternative. It's a separate discussion. If one finds a way to lead a spirit, to, if one finds a way to follow a spiritual path throughout one's life that becomes or that expresses itself in terms of destiny, then again one has succeeded in, in, in employing a level of will. Now the reason I got interested in this is because I was looking at I was looking at people in comparison with myself and thinking how why what why would a person a be able to do it and b want to do it when people put themselves voluntarily into situations which you couldn't pay me to do. I mean there is there is virtually no incentive I can think of that would make me run an ultra marathon or, you know, experience huge privation um, for, uh, for a greater glory. I was... <clears throat> One can, one can, Ralph Fiennes is an actor, similar to Tom Cruise, and he has a brother, Ranulph Fiennes. Ranulph Fiennes isn't an actor, he's a professional explorer. He's, for want of a better word, a hero in a time when heroes are not called for. So Ranulph Fiennes holds world records for adventuring and enduring in a way that we're more used to we're, we're more used to in the 19th and 18th centuries than before. The, the physical achievement, the physical endurance, the probation are hard to hard to hear about, let alone relate to. It's very interesting. This is a person in my time with my level of experience, my level of knowledge, and yet so so different. And I think what is um, inspirational um, about it is precisely that. And a person whose brother is a, a famous actor, not that different to many, many other famous actors. And if it's, if it's uh, 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 the, um, having a brother like that, if you're looking, if you're looking at it from the point of a of view of apposition, uh, <clears throat> from the point of view of, of, of a position that doesn't move, again, uh, the similarity is more striking than the difference. So we have 
adventuring is a classical adult type in, in transaction analysis terms as opposed to the classical child type of the of the actor and so we have ways to understand how life after life manifests itself over the course of multiple lifetimes still within the discipline of long periods of reset so it's so a um, a long enough period such as 2000 years is such a period of rest and change that it is the equivalent of a reset so the most famous of us ceases to be famous after 2000 years of fame the most the highest achieving of us ceases to have achievements that matter after 2000 years and it's time to knuckle down pick up the load walk the path once again it's it's a fair system over the course of that 2000 years it's not a matter of just sitting back in the deck chair in the garden and being fed grapes that is not an appealing proposition which is where the 90 percent of the brain comes in because we now know things about the brain that our ancestors our ancestors could not possibly well could only have guessed for example there's documented evidence of drunk people designing planes having no knowledge of planes and no knowledge of design but in a drunken stupor picking up a pen and sketching out the implementation of a plane completely out of the blue other skills becoming evidenced during periods of drunkenness what we have is we have evidence that the 90 percent of the brain which is available to be used under 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 certain circumstances is used outside of our remit our conscious volition and if you consider the logic of hypnosis you begin to see just how that works we'll discuss it in a minute the logic of hypnosis explains allows us to understand the principle of the hand in the glove of consecutive concentric minds and this is absolutely fundamental to understanding the group mind and how the group mind can evolve and operate on a universal level the logic of hypnosis explains how it is that we find it so natural and convenient and straightforward to juggle multiple inconsistencies and even contradictions it's absolutely natural to us so much so that when we look 200 500 a thousand fifteen hundred years into the past we see a picture to which we cannot relate because we cannot go 500 years back in terms of uncertainty so we cannot understand the contradictions that were being juggled by those earlier people and when we look a five, when we look a hundred five hundred a thousand years into the future it's just as impossible to guess what the contradictions that those people will be juggling will feel like we we can 
take an objective look, we can say, oh, well, it'll probably be like this. That's very, very easy to do, but it doesn't have any significance to people. It doesn't have any, it doesn't carry any weight without being able to understand what it might feel like. And that is That is the fascination of the discussion. That is the fascination of the subject. If it was easy, people would have been doing it well, well before me. What I want to do now is to discuss the past and the future of the mind, not just the present. And that will allow me to describe what came before the present and what came, or rather, what led into the present and what I believe leads beyond the present. Now, this book is not an academic publication. It's not written by an academic. It's not written for an academic audience. It doesn't pretend to be an academic development, although there's no reason why it couldn't be. This book also knows its limits. This book also isn't written by an academic and it isn't for an academic audience exclusively. It's for an academic audience as well as a non-academic audience. A book that is written by an academic and is primarily, was primarily for an academic audience, although it, found, it definitely found a wider public, is a book written by a man called James. And it's called the bicameral mind and along with a book by Edward de Bono which was published at the same time as Lateral Thinking so one of his very very first works and it was called The Mechanism of Mind these are the two books that I think have the most to say to us about how, what a theory of mind needs to cover, explain, develop, build upon, etc, etc. Now the bicameral mind is a much later in time intervention than de Bono's work. It's very unlikely you haven't come across it whereas it's very likely you have come across de Bono's work and have assimilated that. What is the theory of the bicameral mind? It's a theory that beyond 2000 years ago, humanity was not role-based. So for the last 2000 years, it has been role-based. And that is something that we living in today's world have absolutely in common with people living 2000 years ago. So it connects us to the thinking of the very, very early birth of religion. It connects us to the thinking of the very, very early birth of philosophy. And it connects us to the experiences of those times through writing. However, mankind's history, humankind's history, goes back way before that. So there's a question mark about how we see the development of mind to the point where it reaches that level of sophistication, to the point where we stand apart from animals instead of just being beasts ourselves. James describes a world which is prehistoric in the sense that it's the civilization before what you might call the Roman and Greek worlds. 
It's a civilization which culminates in the Oracle at Delphi. And it's a civilization where people are led by what you might call uh, non sequential thinking. Sequential thinking being something that we're very familiar with because we see a computer. We see how it works with a computer. We see how it works in the scientific world. What Jaynes is describing is a situation where the two sides of the mind that I've been talking about, the intellectual, what I call the adult side, and the emotional, what I call the child side, are actually much more separated than they are in us. They're separated to the point where when the child they're separated to the point where the child can almost speak words to the adult. It's a world where the Delphi Oracle, the Delphi Oracle goes into what's described as a fugue state and declaims as if speaking non-consciously. Well, there's a lot, there's a lot to describe about this theory. It's complicated. What Jaynes does is to say we have very few written records that we can access going back to such early times. Therefore, we're very limited in what we can research. But he says, possibly one of the richer sources of information is the Iliad. So we're familiar with the Iliad and the Odyssey, Homer's work, uh, written tales of um, adventure, really. So very memorable because primarily for entertainment. But what James is saying is that the Iliad is radically different to the Odyssey. The Iliad is a record of the change from a self-unaware, bicamerally split mind to a completely self-aware, to the extent of being able to inhabit roles, integrated bicameral mind. Now that's very interesting because it's so understandable. You can see how humans interacting repeatedly over millennia and millennia gradually develop a, a greater shared understanding than any other animal group. And the result of that, the, the, um, the shared understanding builds and builds and builds and builds until it becomes overwhelming and the bicameral mind reaches a point of crisis and this is very much James's thrust in, in, in the book that it was, a, it was a crisis situation that, that led to this step change from one thing to another. When I was writing this book, I, I, I was using an intuitive understanding of what I thought we would need to accept if a theory of mind was going to be totally acceptable across the board. By that what I mean is that the individual is a uh, is a product of the body not the mind the mind is the mind is a group entity now in the book 
it was not desirable to explore that avenue at all and in fact I've the whole throughout throughout I concentrated primarily on what the definition of mind had to say in the context of individual minds so there was never a split between the between the individual mind and the group mind except in terms of existing splits like conscience like um, subconscious but we can we can tie across to James and take a step completely beyond that level of understanding James was on the verge of it himself so it's his information for instance particularly about hypnosis which gave me the confidence to think well there's no point in asking anybody if they agree with me because I now know this is this is a set of facts and you don't ask people to agree with you about what you think are, are facts you share your facts and they share theirs James talks about hypnosis because he understands or perceives that um, the mind is is a group now what I'm gonna use from James is some of the examples but what I want to explain about hypnosis is the difference between the body and the mind when it is when it is separated from the body so when I was writing the book I completely grasped the the idea and in fact uh, I found it immensely helpful to realize that um, the mind is aware at every instant of every second it is conscious only while we're awake if we're asleep if we're knocked out if we're killed we're no longer conscious but we continue to be aware let me just write that down now when you fall asleep you slip from consciousness to awareness and when you wake up you slip back from awareness to consciousness the thing about awareness as opposed to consciousness is not just that you have no no uh, sequential concept no sequential uh, It's not just that you have no sequential awareness of time it's that you have no memory to draw upon you don't even know who you are and I bet everybody watching this has had that experience of when they wake up and not immediately but in the course of waking up in a room getting out of bed getting dressed getting breakfasted etc etc I mean obviously a lot quicker than that but but it but but in those few moments of surfacing it comes back to you oh yeah that's who I am oh yeah that's what I'm doing today oh yeah that's what we're doing this week oh yeah oh yeah oh yeah it all it it, it comes as no surprise it just slots into place but there are those fleeting glimpses before that happens of oh, I don't necessarily know that until I make the effort to think of it that's that's curious isn't it so that's what happens when you wake up that's also what happens when you when you start to go to sleep your thoughts drift in a way um, as your thoughts drift they kind of speed up as well thoughts 
come into your mind in a fleeting instant so quite fast. And in fact, when you're asleep, it you you. you <coughs> one of the curious, one of the curious things to notice about being asleep is that actually there's kind of more going on when you're asleep for you than there is when you're awake because impossible things keep happening and they don't seem impossible to you because you've got nothing to draw upon to assess what should and shouldn't happen. So that conscious awareness split is new information in the sense that this is not how pe this is not how um, this is not how James talks he does not talk about us uh, he does not talk about this this difference he does not identify this fundamental aspect of the mind as opposed to the body or the spirit because consciousness has a specific meaning in academia that it doesn't have for me. For me, conscious because I'm a computer programmer, for me, consciousness is that is that is that memory, however long or short it is, and that perception of time, that perception that one thing follows another, however deep or shallow that is. Because I think, well I'm I don't I don't see any other hypothesis so at the moment I think that all animals have that experience all humans have that experience or and, and always have had it's just how it's just how the thing that houses the mind which is the brain works Unlike James, I don't distinguish humans as being different because they're conscious. I distinguish humans as being different because they're self-conscious. Now, animals actually have a degree of self-consciousness as well. So it's not quite as black and white as that, but it's very useful to bear in mind because when, because it, that, that's how we start to talk about the self as opposed to the group. We are talking about the development of self-consciousness and the development of self-awareness as opposed to just there's me and there's the outside, there's me and there's oh there's me again. <coughs> The development of self-awareness is the is is both the group mind becoming aware of itself, but it's also crucially the individual mind becoming aware of itself within the group, and that's the huge difference between life for the last two thousand years and life before that. So, life for the last two thousand years, the whole idea of a role is that you have a preference, <coughs> a destiny, I've called it, separate and in addition to the group destiny. When the Oracle at Delphi was declaiming, she was doing so with the authority of speaking on behalf of the group, not on behalf of herself. That was the whole point of it. That was why it worked. Let's talk about hypnosis with this understanding. So hypnosis is the difference between you when you're Let's talk about hypnosis while we are on, on the subject. Now, hypnosis is an extreme version of going to sleep 
in the sense that you become you 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 enter this suggestible state and what i'm saying is that human minds are cooperative so the you're in control of your mind you're in control of what you think but your ability to think your ability to remember your ability to be uh, to to process intellectually your ability to uh, do thing do anything that isn't the child anything that's part of the adult anything that's part of the appearance all of that comes from a cooperative group mind under your control so when you become hypnotized you it switches over you then don't become in control you become one of the cooperators and that is what is that is something that you're very used that's a situation that you're very you're so used to being in that it's very easy for you to adopt that because you've been dead at least as much as you've been alive and when you're dead that's where the fun comes that's the interesting thing being part of somebody else's mind contributing to to what's good about them or what's um, fun you know contributing to the fun they're having even when it's perhaps not so uh, admirable is 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 the fun you can have I'm not that interested in explaining this um, in a, so as to persuade anybody what the my job here is to explain this so you understand it the same way I do which is well I don't you know there's millions of things I don't know about that but there's nothing I don't know about that that I need to know for it to work and that's 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 all I need to do because I've got uh, I've got stuff to get on with. I've described. Uh, I've described the book of, I've, I've described the book I've written as being written at a certain level of understanding, and it's a level of understanding where you knew that was true, but you didn't need to explain it. It didn't need explaining. Once a theory, once once one. <coughs> Once you've succeeded, okay, so so far we've described the mind totally and utterly in terms of an individual. However, that's not really satisfactory because at the end of the day, my name, my body, my memories are all this one life i have no access to anything i did prior to the last 40 years 50 years 60 years what we would like to have if we're going to have happy people is we would like to have an, a, a, a coherent understanding of purpose, identity, and what makes us happy. So that's why we would always push on. We would always say, yeah, but what about, what about, what if? We would always do that. And that's what, I, that's what I'm gonna do right now.
So what I want to do is to draw a completely new diagram which accurately represents the definition of my mind, just my mind, let's just start with my mind, accurately represents it now as opposed to the group mind. And I can do that very simply because instead of drawing a diagram with me at both the centre and both the edge and then describing the interior, I can draw a diagram with me in the interior and that diagram would look like this. So this shaded part This shaded part is now me and me alone and there are people whose author people, not quite the right word. We can draw a diagram like this and it's the bare minimum of what we could possibly draw at this point. However, the evolution of self-awareness that's been going on, if you agree with James as I do, not just the last 2,000 years but the last 10,000 years, 100,000 million years, that gradual, gradual evolution continues. So we, our, our, dest, our, our future and our eventual destiny cannot not be tied up with becoming more self-aware, more capable of cooperation and separation and distinction. So although that's the bare minimum of the diagram we can draw, I'm very keen to develop that further, not just because I know I can, because there are immediately, there are immediately reasons why that particular diagram isn't accurate. Why is that the width it is? You know, these are, these are exactly the questions that allowed me to develop an entire book out of the original definition of mind, and I know that diagrams do answer these questions when they're correct. And I know that there's a better diagram here. So what I will do, obviously I'm not gonna, I can, I can't draw an accurate diagram as easily as I can prepare it and then present it. So what I'll do is I'll do just that. I'll leave, I'll leave that, at this point and then I'll come back with the prepared version and discuss that briefly. I'll just borrow this for one final well, I'll just borrow this so that I can finish off this section because I just want to talk a little bit more about hypnosis and get that a little bit clearer in our minds. So when I'm, well, when now I am like this, I am making my mind do what I tell it. If I was hypnotized, a way to draw that 
would be to reverse these arrows. Now, we've all seen those amazing demonstrations of people when they are hypnotised being told a ice cold bath is not, is not, is, is lukewarm or being told or being asked where is the Millennium Dome when and being told I've no idea when it's in the camera shot and my favourite one of all being told we're not actually a concert pianist at all but we are going to be giving a concert on the piano in two weeks time <clears throat> so we better start practicing oh look when we practice we're really quite good oh look it's being advertised so it's definitely going to happen oh look well i appear to be able to play happily when i'm in the when i'm on my own well we'll better just give it a try then oh look we've given the concert and it went down a storm fantastic oh by the way you were hypnotized throughout that whole period you are actually a concert pianist it's just that you were made to forget it because you were so jaded and fed up with rehearsing that you wrote in and said please could please could this be done to me because I'm so jaded and fed up I can't bear to pr practice anymore a lovely lovely little um, story when so the reason so the reason I'm saying this is because it's hard to understand what's going on in the individual mind when one is being told things that one knows are impossible or ridiculous or just plain untrue I've talked going right back to going right back all the way I've talked about most of one's life being spent juggling impossibilities difficulty no I've talked about most of one's life being spent juggling two contradictory things in many many areas in um, at work at home with with family and friends there's a there's a um, an ongoing uh, requirement to not know for certain but still to decide and to act and to go forward how is it that the individual mind can be so flexible and yet the group mind can be so capable <clears throat> in all of, in all its in all its intellectual and practical works I think what sheds light on the answer to that, what sheds a great deal of light on the answer to that, is an experiment that James reported in his book. You know, if you hypnotise somebody and you completely humiliate them in public, there's a, there's a cost to that. And that's exactly what you'd expect. I'll come back to that in a minute but first I want to I want to introduce James's piece of information which is that when somebody's hypnotized if you tell them this person who's just entered the room is Father Christmas they'll say hello Father Christmas I mean they will be completely happy that that information is usable 
and true. They, they, won't, they won't blink an eyelid. If a second person walks into the room, <clears throat> you can tell the same person that that second person is Father Christmas. Not only will they be just as happy as they were the first time and be just as prepared to put that information to use as they were the first time, but they'll continue to believe the first person is but the same person. If the individual mind is able to do that, then it can damn well do anything you need it to do as part of this intellectual processing. It's so flexible that it's beyond, it's, it's way, way beyond anything that a computer can do. It's, it's way, way beyond anything that an actual awake individual can do. So I have absolutely no problem that there are rings and rings and rings and rings of these minds within this individual. I have absolutely no problem that there are rings and rings and rings of groups of these minds within this individual. It's, and it's like a hand within a glove. So I can either be hypnotised with the arrows pointing this way, or I can be in charge with the arrows pointing the other way, conscious and awake and healthy. But I can't be half and half. I can't, I can't, I can't come between. It's, I can't come between the layers of the onion. So that's not the purpose of this work. That's not, a, in my best judgment, that's not an interesting avenue to explore because for, for and we already have the answers that So I'm not looking to hypnosis or, um, or a new self-awareness, a new self-consciousness. I'm not looking to those to be, um, <clears throat> to be the new industry. Um, I'm happy that the theory has been rounded out to the point it has and people can make up their own minds about it. We potentially have a new diagram. Is that what we need? You'd be forgiven for wondering if the whole basis of this thinking is cooperation and there's no element or room for co for competition. That would be an astute observation based on the idea that an individual, an instance of a mind, a living person, consists of many layers, like an onion, of inner minds which are cooperating in order to allow the in individual to have memory and personality. But if we're basing our, the centre of our idea of mind on the idea of conscience, then we seem to be suggesting that cooperation is the, is the mechanism by which conscience operates as well. But of course, the key thing about conscience is that when you do something that your conscience can't accept, such as uh, stealing money that doesn't belong to you, murdering somebody, those classic um, sins, 
your conscience doesn't leave you, it stops speaking to you. Now, the best way that I've found to think of that is that these layers of cooperation, which are normally like the, the skin of an onion or a hand in a glove, they're normally inseparable from the point of view of any kind of distinction that we could ever possibly make from outside. But that doesn't alter, alter the fact that in your thinking, you're, you've got complete flexibility. So you can come between those layers as part of your free will as as much as you like so your thinking isn't off limits until you go against conscience and when you go against conscience those layers freeze together and they freeze together permanently so when that still small voice stops speaking you cannot then later undo that it's, it's set in stone. The genius of that is that it, it allows what is effectively an infinite space to stay infinite. So any, any mechanism which one could think of for the conscience to operate, which involved the, these sub-minds, for want of a better phrase, any mechanism which required them to leave as part of the operation of the mechanism would mean that you were then dealing with a non-infinite, with a non-infinite mechanism and that, that, then, that then becomes mechanical and uh, diff, uh, and requires the kind of bookkeeping that raises problems for most people when they think about reincarnation. When the bookkeeping happens automatically internally, because that's the only bookkeeping that's needed, those problems are, are inherently not there. And that's why this is, this is so simple it almost isn't worth explaining it. People have noticed this mechanism in operation and they've referred to it as being blocked. So one's, uh, a particular individual's thinking is blocked in some invisible way. People have noticed it, they've remarked upon it, they've built philosophies about it. Scientology was based on the idea that you could clear these blocks by having uh, a particular approach to your mind. As I say, it's a very, very simple mechanism that almost isn't worth explaining it would only really make sense to explain how the conscience worked if somebody was putting forward an alternative. And since nobody is, there's little, there's little to be gained from knowing how, how it works. My whole, my, whole, uh, my whole basis is to say, yes, it's based on the conscience, but knowing how the conscience works doesn't make it work any differently, doesn't mean you can do anything in addition to it. It's, it's old knowledge. So why is a, a new diagram so exciting? Why, after 30 years of having lived with a book that uh, w said everything that needed to be said at the time and hasn't really uh, lent itself to um, serious revision since. Why, why, why get excited now? Well, part of the answer is because in the book we've explicated a diagrammatic basis for understanding. 
And that's tremendously exciting. A diagram that is exact is a tool for uh, operation. So it's the basis for actually doing, which is tremendously exciting. And what we've, what we've done, what I think uh, the book set out to do and has done to the best it has done the best it could is to basically lay out the operation from outside of three components of mind so yellow red blue adult child parent how do these vary in relation to each other so issues of size issues of operation issues of ob observation how do these manifest in personality in what areas of life do we see this happening and how does it relate to mental health and mental uh, illness that's what we've that's what we've done from outside and we've done it completely What's exciting about this, what's exciting about the bicameral mind, the new information uh, uh, as a way of looking at hypnosis and uh, other aspects of, of, of the history of mind, is that for the first time we can potentially actually go inside we know we can't come between the layers of the onion, but it's a. But what we're being reassured about is that the continuation of self-discovery is a totally legitimate uh, ambition for both the individual and the group and mankind as a whole, and that's what we're. That's what we're really. That's what we're aspiring to do with this new diagram. So let's take this Let's take this simplified single diagram and delve into it by, by firstly, the very first thing to do would be to split these, split this ring up so that it, so that it has three elements rather than being a single element. So let's, so we'll do that. And in doing that, what we're trying to do is derive a a single accurate descriptive diagram from scratch. I'm not going to use colours for this, but what I am going to do I'm going to draw a ring which represents the, the you or the me that is within the mind. So let's say this, i.e. the mind as a whole, is you, but this is really you. If I, if I use myself as an example, I have a first name, I have a surname. The combination of the two is not unique. I have a physical body. 
I have a, a history from when I was born, I have an address where I live. All of these are, are part of my individuality, part of my identity, but they are not me. They are not me because I will continue to live beyond this particular instance of life, just as I came to live in this particular instance of life from previous instances of life. And we all, we've all done that. It's, it's the nature of life. So let's say this is you in quotes, and this is really you. What, what is the difference? That's, if we're looking for evidence, what is the evidential difference? Well, in the case of the adult, as opposed to the child and the parent, I've already said that as a result of reading the bicameral mind, as a result of reading about hypnosis as used as an entertainment, and as a result of observation and deduction, it's apparent that hypnosis reverses suggestion. So the individual spends their working, spends their, con their spends their uh, spends their conscious day suggesting what to do to their mind. Uh, uh, something comes into your, a suggestion may come into your mind, you may think, shall I go to the gym? You'll think about it, you'll say, yes, I think I will go to the gym, I don't particularly want to, but I know it's good for me, it's a good time, I'll, I'll be glad if I do, so yes, I'll go to the gym. Or, no, I won't go to the gym, it's not a good time, or I should go, but I'm not going to, because I don't, I don't, because I don't care that it's the important, that, it, that it's the right thing to do. <clears throat> if you're hypnotised, the suggestion comes in from outside that you want to go to the gym. Well, when you wake up, you will believe that, you, that it's you that wants to go to the gym. You will not be aware that you've received a, a, a hypnotic suggestion. Now, most of the time, that's harmless. Most of the time, when it's used for, edu for entertainment purposes, it's harmless. So we can observe that and we can marvel at it and wonder. However, it's not a harmless thing to do 100% of the time. There are recorded instances where people have been hypnotised in front of a, an audience they have been made a fool of in front of an audience and afterwards they have not liked that. Quite often over a long period. So if your cooperation is used to make a fool out of you, that's going to cause a problem for your pride, quite understandably, quite naturally. Pride is an element of the, pride in my development of this theory, is fundamentally an element of the adult, as is the cooperation that allows memory and cognition of truth. So all of that in the, in the area of hypnosis ties together as a separate thing. So what I'm going to do now is to remove the other two because I'm going to represent those differently because we've we've done what I wanted to do with the adult so I'm going to take that away because now 
because shortly when we come on to the parent, it's going to be a question mark about where you are, where you appear diagrammatically in this area. Similarly here. Now, what reveals the child element of you as opposed to the child elements of you? The answer needs to be something as simple and, and strange as hypnosis, and it is. The answer is alcohol. Partially cigarettes, also, I'm sure other psychoactive drugs, which I'm less familiar with, but the, 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 just like hypnosis is far and away the simplest example, alcohol is far and away the simplest example. So if I put this ring back in now, what I'm going to do if we were dividing the adult up, what we would do is we would draw layers within the rings. If we wanted to, if we wanted to say this person has ten subminds, I hate that phrase, but uh, it's all I can use for the moment. Um, then we would draw ten, nine lines to indicate ten divisions, and they would be layered that way. With the child. That isn't, that isn't so much what we would do. We would still have an inner and an out, we would still have um, sub-minds functioning at an, an inner, functioning at an inner level and an outer level, as well as our own level, but <coughs> The cooperation between the child elements isn't so much lateral all the time as it is freeform. So the best way to represent that is to draw segments like that. So if I if I clarify this by drawing this then so I'm separating out from this thick group this thick band which represents a group I'm separating it separating out the absolute fundamental that is the this individual mind might be me might be you might be somebody else might be different in somebody else but for general purposes this thinner band is going to be you and when we take alcohol what we do is we collapse our awareness so we are our cognition is greatly limited but not only that our social awareness is limited our um, and, and, and our spontaneity is increased. So again, alcohol, the, the characteristics of alcohol as opposed to hypnosis are all fully encompassed by the characteristics of this one component, the child. And the rather lovely feeling of warmth and good and, 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 and fun that you have while you're drinking alcohol <coughs> illustrates this sort of being surrounded by cooperators who have goodwill towards you. because they think they are you and that lasts at the time but then of course there's a price to pay when you when the effect of the alcohol wears up 
and it's not all sweetness and joy. Sometimes. So that's all clear. Now, what about potentially the most interesting but also difficult component, the parent? Well, actually the way to represent the parent is as circles because the parent is the visible manifestation of the mind as much as anything. It's the social element, the conscientious element, the seat of personality. So those things that we associate already with the mind, personality in the round, those things are what we are what we associate with what is within the parent as well. So actually we draw a bunch of these rings of different sizes and just as Hypnosis shows that there is no separation between the minds within the mind and you. So the parent shows that there is complete separation between those within the mind and you, but no difficulty as a result of that. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take one of these and I'm going to say and that is you as opposed to you. I'm extremely limited in what I can do here because I don't have any clinical experience. Uh, my job is, as a, is, to, is to be a computer programmer to, uh, to fund me to do this. So it's completely unrealistic to think that I could ever possibly develop this in any sort of clinical situation which of course is absolutely what is needed. All I can do is literally scratch the surface of what, of what, of what the possibilities might be because it's not my job. So although I think that is tremendously exciting, I don't think it's of the slightest use to me personally. This relates to, for those who are interested, this relates to page 95. In this book, it's the one place where I have, let me just find it. I remember writing this and I remember thinking it's the one time where I have genuinely gone inside the mind and it was this diagram which essentially shows <coughs> a mind within the mind. In the diagram it's the same mind and the difference between them is as a result of time rather than as a result of externalities. So they are relationally different to each other, but that's not because they're, that's not because they're moving or indifferent. <coughs> <coughs> they're relationally different to each other, but that's not because they're in a different position. It's because over time they have a different significance by comparison. 
you remember that you remember that what we've said in terms of mind space is that one has a position which cannot change the only thing that can change is that is that one can be alongside a different person than one is alongside at the moment and that's a connection between individuals so these circles don't really represent different positions in any sense at all what they actually represent is different relations So having set that out in stone, I would then, to develop this whole line of thinking further, I would then go back to my thinking in theory, pick up and try and move forward from page, from the point where I reached, which was the limit I could reach at the time, try and take that forward and understand understand this more deeply so that describes what we might, that describes one of the ways which we might look to take this forward on the basis that what we're trying to do is develop our own self-consciousness and the self-consciousness of the group. And where this comes from is the development of self-consciousness as a result of the bicameral mind developing into this three three component role based model that we're so familiar with through films books and so forth today which does bring me bring me back to one final observation about the iliad and as a result of reading james's book which is that the odyssey by comparison is a straightforward adventure adventure story it's it's myth making which story has been since the time of robin hood since the time of king arthur since the time of beowulf there has been myth making story and the odyssey is along those lines the iliad according to james is rather a different kettle of fish because james is saying that for him it's the strongest evidence for the idea that he's putting forward of this development from a bicameral mind to the modern mind and a period of crisis. And the observation I would be very keen to add to that is that as well as telling ourselves adventure stories for myth-making purposes, we've always done something else as well and the something else as well that we've always done is to record our own history so we tell ourselves what happened and that that really means what we think happened we record our understanding and i can't help thinking that the iliad is likely to be that type of story it's likely to not just be a story about what happened it's likely to be a story about what we understand happened think biography because and i'd love to see it i think there's every likelihood that the iliad some in some way reflects self-consciousness about self-consciousness 
what was happening was the self was becoming conscious, the group self, and what it what seems to me a, a, a very valuable thesis to explore is that the self was conscious of itself becoming self-conscious and thought, I've got to make this into a story because it's such a good story, because that's what we do. That's what we've always done. It's for somebody else to say yay or nay, but I think it's worth asking the question. I want to talk to you about uh, things I love and we've covered film, we've covered comics. I want to talk about science fiction but it's a bit more difficult because I find it more difficult to share the love I have for science fiction. I think it was Doctor Who that first kindled my fascination. I started, Doctor Who started in 1963 um, so I was an infant when it, it, it began so I grew up uh, with it on television and what a what a fabulous mind expander that was and that's what I was so hungry for for right until the end of my 20s and so you might say, oh, well, you, you would have loved um, the great science fiction films and uh, TV programmes, um, The Prisoner, Alien, Close Encounters, Star Wars, Star Trek, etc. And I certainly, certainly would have gone out of my way to watch them, some of them more than once, but um, often from the point of view of wishing there was more um, because the because the medium of science fiction short stories uh, offered something that um, in many ways nothing else could compete with in terms of um, doorways uh, through to one to to to, to wonder Looking back on it, I think that the, 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 the most wonderful thing was uh, coming across what, what were effectively parables. Uh, so if you're in any doubt as to whether morals actually exist, whether they're real, um, then it's a, it's a great way to uncover the, the reality of morals, is to see them made real in this in this way even though it was science fiction the science fi the fiction aspect was an excuse to present uh, the parable the parable um, in an accessible uh, way and the success of that accessibility was that you were you didn't have to go looking for parables they were just there on the way so as you read this wonderful selection of science fiction that was available every so often you'd come across a particularly strong clean beautiful example and it's only with hindsight you realize that oh yeah the thing they had in common was that they were all kinds of versions of parable you know they were all um they all had this uh they all match the definition of a parable, which is simply a story that points up a moral. There were two things that um, I can share with you about the experience of reading science fiction. Uh, the first was coming across the authorial voice and um, that's something that any keen reader will will be very familiar with the idea that when you're reading a story or a novel or a book 
there's there's a certain uh, style uh, which a particular which which identifies an author whatever their sub which identifies an author through what it, through what may be whatever whatever subject matter or uh, story um, plot uh, is being told uh, one comes to realize that there's an authorial uh, signature which is recognizable even though on the surface it's completely uh, new or foreign or uh, or even familiar uh, well-known um, terrain it's actually a bit the same with uh, art um, one of the things that I've said about comic art is is that part of the joy is seeing that every comic artist draws differently even 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 the most uh, similar pictures look different when drawn by a different artist simply because there's that same artistic style signature voice that that is just something completely unique um, and and different every time inexhaustibly unique remarkable so when you one of the great things about one of the great things about reading science fiction and and realizing that there were these nuggets of gold amongst the diamonds and rubies um, was the coming across a, a particularly attractive authorial voice which combined with the the, the, the golden the golden nugget um, so I, I I remember the names of authors even so if I was trying to explain to somebody the attraction of science fiction I would be talking in terms of the names of authors rather than the titles of stories. If I was talking about films, I'd always talk about the, I'd always give the film title as the, as the lead in. But with, with science fiction, it's, it's much more about the authors I read at the time. And I think that rather than me, I mean, the <clears throat> I can't, I didn't make notes, I didn't, con I didn't consciously observe, and so I don't have a record to go back to, um, and and wouldn't necessarily, I don't have a record to go back to, unfortunately, to share with you so that I can bring you into my into my past um, and I wouldn't possibly think that I should do that uh, because I think that once you know that reward is available and on offer that's really your cue to find your own experience and your own authors um, I don't think you need a guide you just need to be willing to do the the legwork and find out for yourself the other thing that comes across that I was going to mention uh, for for, for um, the experience of reading science fiction uh, short stories in particular much more than novels um, there's something there's something fundamentally mysterious about a short story which is designed to get to from from a to b or a to z depending how complicated the journey as cleanly and clearly as possible there's something wonderful about it it's halfway it's almost you uh, uh, 
a great science fiction story is halfway between a poem and a, a prose story. Very often the content isn't fully explained and that's part of the mystery and magic of it. That's part of the atmosphere of it. So it's a, 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 it's a hugely appealing It's a hugely appealing use of your sense of wonder to to explore this explore these new worlds and if you're hungry for that as I definitely was <clears throat> probably until I was 30 then you will read a lot of science fiction which is what I did by the time I was 30, I was exploring reality, not conceptuality. I was pretty... I'd come from uh, doubt to a point of understanding. So um, my sense of wonder was... Uh, it wasn't my sense of wonder that needed feeding, it was my... It was my general knowledge and experience that needed feeding. So hence the changeover. And it, although I've read science fiction short stories frequently in the intervening years, I read some great ones. And I wish I could remember those as well to share them with you. Um, but again, you don't need a guide. Uh, to modern science fiction and short stories any more than to the past, to the classic ones. So I, won't, I don't need to do that. But certainly I, uh, like with films and like with comics, it's the pleasure of the things I've already read that outweighs and exceeds the promise and possibility of the things I could read or see or um, or find for myself. So hence it's a lower priority now for me. I'll finish by reading the contents page of the one anthology of science fiction that I've got in my, um, on my bookshelf at the moment because I've always gone to the library for, for, for books. I've never um, never had the uh, space or, or, or need really to own them. Um, this is the 19th annual best of the year, edited by Gardner de Zouar. <clears throat> and I'll just read the contents page, just the titles of the stories. New Light on the Drake Equation. When this world is all on fire, Computer virus. Lobsters. The chief designer. One horse town. Moby quilt. Raven dream. Isabel of the fall. Into Greenwood. Know how, can do. That's a selection, there are many others. It uh, fires the imagination just to read the titles. It's like reading a half, a half written poem. The, the, the titles don't kind of explain anything because explanations are addition, are, are, are additional to what is on. Because explanations are additional to the experience. One 
one of the high points in my memory is uh, the conjunction of comics with science fiction, which happened when Marvel published a black and white original art graphic novel called Unknown Worlds of Science Fiction. It lasted six issues to the best of my to my knowledge, which is not the best of any anybody's knowledge, there hasn't been anything like it or anything since, and it wasn't a big seller, um, unfortunately. But what it did do was to capture the essence of the science fiction short story at the time when it was a well-kept secret. The era I'm talking about is the era of, is what I would call the Harlan era, Ellison era. So Harlan Ellison started writing science fiction short stories and immediately his voice was kind of recognised as being a little bit unusual. So from, um, from Isaac Asimov to Robert Heinlein, to Frank Herbert's Dune, to um, Ray Bradbury, say, you had a coverage of the range of human emotion and capability that was, um, that was describing brave new worlds of the future rocket ships and uh, 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 ray guns and uh, rescues and uh, clever puzzles. It was uh, a very boyish um, milieu. Harlan Ellison came in and started writing not dystopia but he started writing for, he, he, he started writing individualistic science fiction. So, so for the so um, so he was so so Ellison stories pitted the. Ellison stories uh, had a hero or an anti-hero more often against uh, against um, against a, a, a overwhelming difficulty, and I think that was an unfilled niche at the time. And I think a lot of people um, saw a. A bit like when William Gibson came along and wrote Neuromancer and suddenly there was a fresh new vision of this uh, not, um, not boyish world, this flawed world, flawed future world. I think it was the same with Harlan Ellison. He wrote, he, 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 he succeeded in envisaging a flawed future world which was uh, recognisable and presented a new type of adventure to people who, or amongst people um, who were expert at giving and receiving adventure. So, <clears throat> so unknown worlds of science fiction was uh, the was. Um, one of the very few graphical presentations of science fiction stories, and it included Repent Harlequin, said the TikTok man, which is probably Ellison's second most famous short story, and I think it won the Hugo. Fascinating to see the conjunction of graphic art and pure imagination which science fiction short stories represent and a both a huge success and a massive failure
both at the same time. Uh, for example, um, I was quite familiar with the story when I read it in its graphic form. But one of the things that jumped out at me was in the short story, Ellison said something like um, the, uh, the TikTok man jumped into a fliver and, uh, and rose into the sky. And he had a little asterisk or it was in brackets, I think it was. In brackets, it said, Phew. it wasn't a fliver at all. It was a skyfly or something like that. So he was kind of making a joke about, uh, about um, you know, how science fiction writers are precious about their, about their, about, about what, about what they name the things they imagine. In the graphic story, you had, uh, you had this put into the context of a graphic panel and a, um, the, um, the author's comment became an editor's comment because that's what the top, that's what the top bits of panels, which are not people speaking, are. They're, they're narrator's comments. And then it had the asterisk there and the line below. And the thing that jumped out at me was that is a, that is a really uh, nice way to pick out and, and underline that, that moment in the story. And that really works in that conversion from one medium to the other. That really works. There were other examples of things that really worked. Uh, one of the stories was uh, Larry, Larry Niven's story. Uh, I think it's called The Sorcerer or The Magician. Um, and it's about a magician. I think it might be called The Magician versus The Barbarian. It's about, the, and that's what it's about. Uh, a very old, very powerful magician, a very, not very old, very brutal barbarian. And it's about the past versus the future as much as it's about the, the, the magic versus brute force. And of course, that really worked as a graphic story because it was a very linear, uh, uh, visceral, um, uh, simple tale. Um, which lent itself to drawings of a barbarian, you know, muscly, uh, stupid, um, powerful, physically powerful, and, uh, and an old man bent over, except when he weaves his magic, he suddenly um, uh, every bit a match for this, for this adversary, um, except that he can never, oh, I shouldn't tell you the end, um, and so that, 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 that was a wonderful, wonderful read. Um, but even better than that was, I think it was another Larry Niven um, about uh, a crew that goes to uh, an alien planet, as, as, as one should do in these things, goes to an alien planet, lands on this alien planet, finds it completely deserted, comes across this village. This village is really strange. It's got all awkward shapes, wrong sizes. It's got things that are too hot, hard to hard to hard to process. Uh, it's it's, it's and, and where is everybody? And again, I can't tell you the ending because I can't possibly store it. It's, can't possibly spoil it. But the ending actually in the story was uh, a very clever twist ending. In the graphic story, it was presented visually. So the whole twist was shown instead of explained and, you know, having to be, uh, having to, you having to read the explanation. And that, that, the neatness of that was just fabulous. Unfortunately, most of the time, and it was true of Repent Harlequin, most of the time, what you don't want, it, 
what and can't have in the, in it, somebody else do for you is to take this half visualized uh, wonderfully mysterious thing that you've imagined which is the world that somebody else has created and then have it rendered in in crass lines and made up things that the artist has had to add in order simply to in order simply to make it comprehensible so I think perhaps the reason why it wasn't as successful ultimately was because there are some there are some stories that work really well but but that isn't the basis for a for a comic uh, for a for for that isn't the basis for a publishing co group to make indef uh, unlimited and indefinite uh, make an unlimited and indefinite amount of comic issues possibly